glaucoma. Congenital glaucomas are a group of diverse disorders in which an abnormal high intraocular pressure results due to developmental anomalies of the angle of the anterior chamber obstructing the drainage of the aqueous humor. So we'll go through the different classifications. Either it can be a primary congenital glaucoma, which means it's a true congenital glaucoma and intrauterine life to birth. Then you have got infantile congenital glaucoma, which is up to three years. And then you've got juvenile glaucoma, which is greater than three years. So here you can see primary congenital glaucoma is seen in one in one 10,000 births and 65% are boys is most sporadic and 10% are autosomal recessive. There is an absence of angle recess with iris inserted directly into the trabeculum. So there is a flat iris insertion over here and it's a concave iris insertion over here. So those are two types of insertions which you get in this. And the second classification is developmental glaucoma, which is associated with anomalies like iridocorneal dysgenesis, aniridia, with ectopia lentis syndromes, with phacomatosis, and miscellaneous conditions. So what is the pathogenesis? Why does it happen? And wh what is different from adult glaucoma? In primary congenital glaucoma is due to failure or abnormal development of the trabecular meshwork, as we explained before. There is maldevelopment of the trabeculum, including the iridotrabecular junction, which is called trabecular genesis, and is responsible for impaired aqueous outflow, resulting in raised intraocular pressure. Trabecular dysgenesis is characterized by absence of angle recess with iris having a flat or concave direct insertion into the surface as I showed you before. The iris may not completely separate from the cornea and the angle remain closed by persistent embryonic tissue. So there is something which is present in the angle which is causing the problem. So normally you would have the anterior the aqueous flowing from the ciliary, bo uh, ciliary processes into the posterior chamber, going through the pupil, into the anterior chamber, and through the trabecular meshwork. This trabecular meshwork, the beams of the trabecular meshwork are not fully open. So those are thin, and there's a sometimes the iris insertion is going over it, or the ciliary body insertion is going over it. So that is the reason you're getting this congenital glaucoma. So the pathogenesis of glaucomatous ocular damage is same for uh, congenital and for adult onset glaucoma, which is mechanical changes due to rise of IOP that causes the glaucoma or either vascular perfusion of the optic disc head, which is compromised or defective autoregulation of the blood supply of the optic nerve. So here you see these are the typical pictures which you see uh, in patients with glaucoma. Uh, you can see this is the cupping which you are seeing. So this is the area. So this would and this cupping is more asymmetrical it is more the rim is less superiorly compared to the inferior area and here you can see the there is advanced cupping nasalization of the blood vessels and uh, there is the laminar dot sign and these patients have large cup this would be a cup disc ratio of nearly 1.0 and this would be nearly 9 or 8 cup disc ratio so what are the symptoms of congenital glaucoma. The interesting thing in congenital glaucoma is if you increase the intraocular pressure in, a, in an adult, it typically will not increase the size of the eyeball. But in congenital glaucoma, it's actually the size that increases. The eyeball inflates with the intraocular pressure and their eye tends to get the bigger shape and Typically, it is called a buphthalmos because it starts to look like a bullseye, the animal. So that's why it's also called. So why do you get photophobia, blepharophasm, <coughs> necromation, and eye rubbing in these patients? They are thought to be caused by the irritation of corneal nerves, which results due to raised intraocular pressure. Photophobia usually is the initial sign, but is not enough by itself to arouse suspicion in most cases. 
In these patients, when the intraocular pressure rises, the eyeball size increases, but due to the raised intraocular pressure, the pressure in the anterior chamber is beyond the capacity of the endothelial pump to push fluid back into the anterior chamber, thereby causing fluid to go into the cornea, which produces corneal edema, and that's the reason you get photophobia. What are the signs? Corneal edema, as I already mentioned in the last slide, is frequently the first sign which arouses suspicion. Then you've got corneal enlargement. I said the eyeball starts to increase, the cornea also increases. <clears throat> it occurs with enlargement of the globe and both thelma, especially when the onset is before the age of three years, when the sclera is more elastic and it can enlarge in size. Then there's a very, very important sign, which is Hobstria. These are tears and breaks in the decimator membrane. So when the corneal size is increasing, the, en the decimator membrane is of, of, of a definite length and it does not increase but it snaps when the cornea goes to a size bigger than what it can take. So these occurs uh, because the decimator membrane is less elastic and usually they are peripheral and concentric with the limbus. So the clinical features, the corneal lima associated bophthalmos, here you can see the eyeball is both eyes are bigger in size, breaks in desmase membrane or herb striae are seen and we've got optic disc cupping, all are seen in congenital glaucoma. What are the other signs? The sclera becomes thin and appears blue due to the underlying uveal tissue because of stretching of the of the sclera due to raised intraocular pressure, this, the sclera becomes thin and the uvea starts to show through. Anterior chamber also becomes deep because the size of the eye elongates and you tend to get a myopic shift. Iris may show iridodysgenesis and atrophic patches in the, in the late stage. It is because when the eyeball stretches anterior posteriorly, it also stretches vertically. When it stretches vertically, it, it will cause the root of the iris to become bigger or the ciliary body to become to stretch outwards and that will cause the zonules to stretch and eventually break and that's the cause of iridogenesis iridogenesis in these patients and the lens becomes flat because of that and they may even subluxate in these patients. So you've got myopic patients in which the lens can be subluxated or have an iridogenesis. The optic disc may show variable cupping and atrophy especially after the third year. But in children it's interesting that when you control the intraocular pressure sometimes you can tend to get some reversal of the no fiber loss. The IOP is raised, which is neither marked nor acute. And axial myopia, as I already discussed, may occur because of increase in, intra in axial length, which may give rise to an isometropic amblyopia. If one eye has congenital glaucoma and the other eye does not have, it can be asymmetrical. So you have to see what the presentation is in this patient. Here you can see this is the the thinning of the sclera, which is producing these outpocketing of the sclera, and these are tend to be called staphyloma as well. Staphyloma is an outpocketing of the eyeball, which is lined by uveal tissue. Here you can see in this patient has got unilateral glaucoma with both thelmos only present in the left side. Here you can see this is interesting picture in which you see this reddish area. This is called uh, nevus flamius and this uh, when it is associated with glaucoma is called Sturge Weber syndrome. So what do you do for these patients? You would examine them under anesthesia. Why? You want to get a baseline intraocular pressure because they will not have the intraocular pressure done otherwise. The normal intraocular pressure is 10 to 15 in these patients but it norm, but again, the upper limit is 21 millimeters. Anesthetics and preoperative dehydration, sometimes lower intraocular pressure, 
Corneal diameter, vernal calipers are used to measure the corneal diameters in infants and gonioscopy is done not with a standard lens but with a separate lens which is a coipe lens. Anterior chamber as deep and angle open with concave or flat insertion of the iris root with abnormal tissue giving rise to chagrin or a glistening appearance in the angle and may also have absent angle recess, peripheral iris hypoplasia, tenting of the peripheral iris, pigment epithelium, thickened uveal trabecular meshwork. So those are the, all the findings which you get on gonioscopy in these patients. So here you can see this is a device which is used to measure the intraocular pressure and this has got the same tonometer which you have with the Goldman applanation tonometer. This tonometer mounted on a mobile device is called a Perkins tonometer. This is typically used to check for intraocular pressure in children. You can also use a tonopen. Here you can see vernier calipers are being used to measure the corneal diameter which is usually about 10 to 11 millimeters of mercury and you, not mercury but 10 to 11 millimeters and you tend to measure it horizontally and vertically. The important thing in this is if somebody's got a diameter of more than 14 millimeters that is a confirmation of bophthalmos or congenital glaucoma. So here you can see the typical Habstroya stretch marks in the cornea, the lines you can see from the high intraocular pressure in a patient with congenital glaucoma and here you can see the left eye a bophthalmic in this patient. Examination under anesthesia also entails examination of the optic nerve. Normally it is pink with small cup but preferential loss is superior and inferior as in adult glaucoma in this glaucoma as well. Cupping may be reversible if IOP is lowered initially, especially this is only happens in children most of the time. The axial length is enlarged and may reverse with reduced intraocular pressure. So you can measure the axial length of these patients. So these are the four or five things which you do when you do an examination under anesthesia. You would also look at the macula to see if there's any macular disease which is causing reduced in vision. So differential diagnosis, most common is in children, you get epiphora and that can be due to nasolacrimal duct obstruction. So if you see patients, parents come in watery, watery eye, you should have a suspicion of congenital glaucoma, but you need to ask them how the watering, if the watering is associated with a discharge, then it's most probably nasolacrimal duct obstruction and then you get regurgitation test positive in that. You can get excellent congenital megalocornea with glaucoma, that is another important differential. In that patient, you will get a normal intraocular pressure, the cup, there will be no cupping of the optic disc, there will be no hops dry, but the corneal diameter will be high. So you need to be following up those patients. Birth trauma can cause this problem, keratitis or uveitis, retinoblastoma, all can confuse with patients with congenital glaucoma. And then you come with corneal dystrophies and dysgenesis because with advanced glaucoma, you will get whitening of the cornea, corneal edema after a stage it tends to produce scarring in the cornea and that produces opacity or the whole of the cornea is opacified. In birds of errors of metabolism and corneal dystrophies they all produce whitening of the cornea so they are confused. So if you get enlarged eyeball with whitening of the cornea then you think it's more probably congenital glaucoma. Intrauterine inflammation like congenital syphilis, rub rubella, optic disc pit, coloboma or physiological cupping. So it is very, very important that you have a clear or understanding of the differential diagnosis. So you treat the patient right at the right stage. So what are the treatment options? So you can have either surgical treatment, which is the mainstay of treatment. Goniotomy is for clear corneas, trabeculotomy for hazy corneas with success rates rather similar and trabeculectomy and shunt procedures or valves only when goniotomy or trabeculectomy fails or trabeculotomy as well. So that is the algorithm and medical treatment is only used as a supportive treatment until you can treat the patient surgically. So goniotomy involves making a horizontal incision at the midpoint of the superficial layers of the trabecular meshwork and may need to be repeated and eventual success rate is about 85% and you need to do it before the corneal diameter reaches 14 millimeters and results of the poor if the diameter is more because at that stage the Schlems canal is obliterated. 
So here you can see you go from with this is the goniotomy knife. You put a contact lens, which is a gonios gonioscope, and you do a 180 degree incision in the trabecular meshwork. You go from one side and do the goniotomy on the opposite side. You have to be careful not to touch the lens and control the bleeding as well. Opening incision is made through the abnormally developed trabecular meshwork to allow greater outflow of the aqueous and thereby lower the intraocular pressure. Often 120 degree out of 360 degree of the trabecular meshwork can be treated with the goniotomy at a single setting. So this is opening of the trabecular meshwork. So you have to be very calculated how much deep you want to go and you open the trabecular meshwork at this area. The other, the next procedure is a trabeculotomy and indicated if the corneal clouding prevents visualization of the angle or when repeated goniotomy has failed. Trabeculectomy, trabeculotomy involves making an external incision and identifying the Schnelms canals from the outside, inserting a fine instrument of the Schnelms canal, trabeculotome, and breaking through the trabecular meshwork into the anterior chamber to increase the outflow of aqueous. Typically, 120 to 140 degrees of trabecular meshwork can be treated by trabeculotomy in a single surgery. So here you can see what you do in goniotomy. You went from inside. Here you identify the trabecular meshwork from outside, which is difficult, or Schnellm glass from outside. And then once you identify, you pass this instrument through that canal, and then you rotate this instrument so that you break or cut through the Schlems canals into the anterior chamber going through the trabecular meshwork. But in these patients, the cornea have become opaque. These are all things which need to be done when the corneal diameter has not enlarged to more than four, 14 millimeters. Medical treatment, we'll discuss before going to the final surgical treatment, is temporary measures. To clear the cloudy cornea prior to surgery, I can administer beta blocker, antagonist, or carbonic ion hydride inhibitors. Alpha, avoid alpha-2 agonist under three years and include nasal acrimal drainage for about two minutes after administration. So you can press in the medial canthus to prevent the tears going into the nasal acrimal duct. Medication can be used as an adjunct before or after the surgical treatments. Medications can be utilized temporarily after the diagnosis and until the surgery can be performed. If the initial surgery fails to completely control the IOP, topical medications can be used to bring the glaucoma under control. The systemic side effects are very important in children. So you have to bear in mind that what drugs you cannot use in these patients. Uh, the side effects are greater in infants than ad adults because of the smaller body mass. Because of the potential side effects, the first line of medication that are commonly employed is the topical carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. After the CIAs, the next choice are topical prostaglandin analogs or beta blockers. The prostaglandin analogs appear to be safe in children. However, there are no long-term data on the safety of these medications in children. Topical beta blockers should be used with caution because of the well-known systemic side effects of asthma and bradycardia. So you need to check that. Finally, topical alpha-2 agonist brimonamine should be avoided in infants because it is associated with severe respiratory depression or breathing difficulty. Prognosis is good in asymptomatic patients diagnosed before 24 months and guarded in asymptomatic patients after 24 months even if IOP is controlled after surgery. At the end, we'd go through the developmental glaucoma associated with ocular or systemic abnormalities. You can get microphthalmos, this is a disease where the eye cornea is small in size. You can get corneal abnormalities such as corneal microcornea, megalocornea, corneal plera, sclerocornea and corneal staphyloma and then you get anterior dysgenesis or anterior segment cleavage syndrome which is axenfield rieger syndrome peter's anomaly and iridoschisis and you can get aniridia lens anomalies such as congenital cataracts lens dislocation microcephalophagia and persistent hyperplastic vitreous phacomatosis such as sturge weber syndrome and neurofibromatosis 1 so these are all conditions which can produce those developmental glaucoma which is associated with systemic diseases or ocular problems. 
The final treatment for congenital glaucoma, if it's not controlled with trabeculotomy or goniotomy, is trabeculectomy or a valve which will control the intraocular pressure. The surgery in children is difficult because of the pliability or because the sclera is not very rigid. So you tend to get more flat changes post-operatively post in children compared to adults. So it has to be done very carefully and by an experienced surgeon. I'll just show you a picture of these ocular or systemic abnormalities associated with glaucoma. We could quickly go through this. Posterior embryotoxin is the posterior ending of the end of the decimase membrane, which is more marked, which is called a posterior embryotoxin, and there are attached strands of posterior embryotoxin, which you can see. Then you go on to a Rieger anomaly, which is autosomal dominant bilateral. And glaucoma in 50% of the patients. Here you start to get stromal hypoplasia, correctopia, ectropian UV. The means that the inside of the iris is exposed on the outside or anteriorly and full thickness iris atrophy. So this is a cleavage syndrome, meaning where the cornea and when the cornea and iris are separating from each other genitally, the iris tends to have abnormality along with the angle. That's called a Rieger anomaly. And when Rieger anomaly is present with these dental and facial anomalies, it is called a Rieger syndrome. Then the, the, the most advanced type of developmental abnormality, here you can see when the developmental opening of the anterior segment is happening, you can see the iris is usually attached, or at that time is attached to the cornea and it separates from that. But in Peter's anomaly, there's an area where even the central area is defective, the cornea is defective, producing scarring in the cornea, or you can get even the lens attached to the cornea, and here you can see anomaly in the iris and in the angle as well. So this is the severest form of cleavage syndrome. And then there's an entity which is called aniridia, means absence of iris. In these patients, you have got abnormal trabecular meshwork, and they tend to have got glaucoma as well. It's not necessary to get bophthalmos, but with, they can either present early or present late as patients of glaucoma. Then we already showed a patient with Sturge Weber syndrome, and glaucoma is seen in 30% with ipsilateral facial hemangioma and bifthalmos in 60% of the patient. It is caused raised venous pressure associated with episcleral hemangioma. The angle may also be affected. And then neurofibromatosis 1 is the last entity we will discuss. It is an ipsilateral neurofibroma of the upper lid in C's in 50% of the cases. And the glaucoma is caused by angle anomaly with or without ectropian UV. Angle neurofibroma may also be responsible. So that uh, finishes our lecture on congenital glaucoma. It's, it's slightly different from adult glaucoma, but in the end, I would like to say that it's like an open angle glaucoma, but here the trabecular meshwork is covered by, or it's not opened up due to developmental maldevelopment. And that causes this type of glaucoma. And the management is slightly different from adult onset. And your time period is very short as well because if you do not treat it early, the eye will continuously grow, grow in size and become bigger. And they tend to get corneal scarring much quicker compared to an adult onset glaucoma. And obviously, if you have a patient who's got corneal problem along with glaucoma is going to be blind and is go producing more disability compared to an adult person. The adult glaucomas are usually primary open angle glaucomas are slowly progressive. The angle closure glaucoma is acute but the patient is so symptomatic that he gets himself treated. So that those are the things which happen in these patients. So thank you very much for listening and we'll be back with more lectures soon.